Hello and uh, welcome to another in the series of Cafe Insights. I'm Andrew Vine, the CEO of the Insight Bureau. And today I'm in conversation with Dr. Yuwa Hedrick Wong. Hello. Welcome Thank back you. to Singapore again. Thank you. Nice being here. You are is the uh, is, a, is an independent global economist and business strategist. He's chief economist with Mastercard Center for Inclusive Growth. So it's great to see you back in Singapore. What brings you here this time? Well, this time we are now a final preparatory stage to launch a partnership with the Singapore Management University to conduct our research in the region to look at inclusive growth and okay. its potential and its impact and what it really means for the economic future. So this very diverse and dynamic region. Terrific. Well, I, while you were here, I wanted to pounce on the opportunities mm-hmm. I've done before. And your take of where we're heading in terms of the, uh, the global economy, it's been a very tumultuous time. It's mm-hmm. been uh, one where we seem to have dodged a few bullets mm-hmm. in terms of some disasters. Mm-hmm. And we were just wondering, really, whether you feel that the worst is behind us now and we can mm-hmm. enjoy mm-hmm. a more stable, sustainable recovery in yeah. the global economy. Well, I, I think there's no question that the worst is behind us if we define the worst as being the, the immediate aftermath of the impact of the global financial crisis. But the second half of your question, now we're going to return to some kind of stable, reliably set kind of recovery. I think that is not in the cards because since the crisis, what, what we have seen is the global economy moving into a very different phase of evolution. Uh, it's moving in a direction that is diametrically opposite from the pre-crisis decade, mm. where, as we all know well, this abundance of easy money and credit created the rising tide lifting all boats phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, emerging markets were seen to be destined to emerge, as it were. Okay, and hence, you know, that's why I've, I've been calling this this future as the, the, the future of a multi-speed global economy. And so the, the overall premise that I hold is that the link that was so evident between the emerging markets and the developed economies, and some have referred to it as the convergence, the great convergence, uh, is fundamentally severed since the crisis. We cannot count on the same kind of you know, relationship where uh, strong growth in the developed economies necessarily followed by strong growth in emerging markets so on. Mm. I think markets are very much on their own. We have to learn to examine markets through a different kind of lens to understand you know, how they perform on their own as opposed to being lifted up by some kind of global trend. Well, we'll return to that when we talk a little bit more about the emerging markets. But before we do, I, I, I just wonder whether we really are out of the woods in terms of Europe. I mean, in America, you were one of the first to actually point to uh, a number of success factors that would be in the, the U.S. economy as a favor. The, the, the problems in Europe don't seem to have been solved yet. No, not at all. I, I think Europe, the Eurozone, to be precise, has purchased a temporary stability at a horrific cost, social, economic, and political cost. The fundamental issue of how to resolve the need to transfer funds from the north of the Eurozone to the south has not been resolved, both from the point of view of institution, the point of view of, of political economy, uh, social consensus, and so on. All these are the hard work that yet to be done. And the, the, the stability has been purchased by the Eurocrats making a compromise. And to me, it's a disastrous compromise that is strategically ineffective, that's costly, that's temporary. And that is, they don't want to socialize the debt, mm-hmm. nor do they want contagion. So they went halfway. They would lend to the crisis country at penalizing interest rates with really severe demand for austerity. That's what we, we, we ended up with today. Well, you haven't been a proponent of the austerity measures as a, as a way of, of solving this problem. The U.S. Has, has been through a number of quantitative easing phases. Mm-hmm. Is this what Europe needs? Well, Europe needs growth fundamentally, economic growth. Uh, and that's the, you know, in, in any debt uh, a crisis, 
the best way to get out of it is that you want to be able to sustain a reasonable economic growth with moderate inflation. That's the best of all possible combinations. Austerity satisfied in the, in the Eurozone the demand of the North, what I would call the, the Old Testament mentality. You, you punish the sinful, <laughs> right? Right. Okay, so, so that was satisfied that the German electorate and, and the Bundesbank and so on. But the cause is horrific. It's, it's a generational tragedy. It's unfolding in front of our very eyes in the crisis countries. When you think of youth unemployment at about 50%. Yeah, and, and th this requires a decade-long period to recover. So we look, we literally staring at the whole, you know, the coming decade. It's a decade of repair, reconstruction, recovery. It's a lot of hard work ahead of the Eurozone. So the crisis by no means over. So it's and going to be a long, drawn-out process. Very much so, yes. The way people have been looking at the emerging markets is interesting because, um, you know, a few years ago, everyone was extremely bullish and in practice overly so and had a tendency, I think, to kind of paint the emerging markets with one brush, which you've never been a, a fan of. But I've been rubbish in the break exactly, concept yes. for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, more realistically, we should be analysing each market in its own merits? Yes. Well, to, uh, to begin with, I think that developed economies themselves are dividing into different groupings. Okay. Okay. You have the US, yep. which is an outstanding performer uh, in the last few years since the crisis in terms of both recovery, in terms of its ability. It, it really speaks volume of its private sector's resilience and the ability for you know, regeneration because it's, yep. it has dysfunctional politics, let's face it. Right? It's a dysfunctional government. Politics is a bit abysmal worse. Yet the private sector can continue to power ahead. It's tremendous. So you have the US, literally stands alone. You have Japan. It's likely to be in stagnation for the foreseeable future. You, then you have the Eurozone, stuck in this long process of repairing yep. all the damage, structural reforms yet to be done, and so on. So from an emerging market universe perspective, then suddenly we're not talking about there's a, a, a developed a, a market universe out there that's pulling the emerging markets ahead. That's number one. Number two is that within the emerging markets, if you look at the, the collapse of the, the commodities market, the collapse of the world price of oil, very quickly you can say, well, the emerging markets should be divided into two camps. The exporters, those who are highly mm. dependent on resource and, and energy exports, and those who are actually importers of resources and energy, they benefit very differently from in, in this new environment. Uh, and then within the emerging markets uh, that are that the beneficiaries of the collapse of commodity and oil prices, again you can divide them up into those who can generate inclusive growth and those who cannot. Because inclusive growth is a growth that can create the middle class, that can generate more domestic demand, consumption. Right? To me, that's the new lens that we need to understand emerging markets, is domestic demand, which has two components, domestic investment and domestic consumption. When growth is more inclusive, these two components then work in a mutually reinforcing fashion. A virtual circle can be set in motion. That's the key, I think, to understand the future of emerging markets. So when you look at the developing world, which are the examples of um, bright prospects from your inclusive growth analysis? Yeah. Now, contrary to a lot of the, the media headlines that, that you may have seen about China to slow down, to me that's precisely the good news. Okay, good. That means China is rebalancing. Right. China actually today has an investment-led slowdown. Yeah. So it's weaning its dependency on this investment-led model. Domestic consumption is now gearing up. For the first time in the last two years, the first time in 30 years, domestic consumption services contributing more than, than half of overall economic growth. So that's a very, very encouraging sign. And that's the what a rebalance China will look like, is that the headline GDP growth will be much lower, but the quality of growth would be higher. China will be importing more for domestic consumption, 
on a per unit GDP basis compared with the past. India has a very, very good chance mm. if we can really tackle some of the tough structural reform, both in terms of labour market liberalisation, addressing this infrastructure deficit, to have a very, very promising domestic consumption led growth story in the making. So I'm quite bullish mm. about that. Within, say, a region like sub saharan Africa, for instance, it turns out a lot of known commodity exporting, known oil exporting countries are doing very well precisely because they can generate domestic demand. Growth is becoming more inclusive in places like Ghana, in places like Ethiopia, for example, not in Angola, not in Zambia, not in Nigeria. So there are individual emerging markets that are really beginning to excel on the basis of domestic demand and of inclusive growth. You've just written about this in the latest uh, GEMS Bellwether report, yes. which uh, we will be uh, circulating in the next week or so. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, it seems to be a much more complex world for international companies to be operating in, because you do need to pay much more particular attention to what's happening in individual well, markets as opposed to groups of markets. Yeah. So I was wondering, you know, what kind of advice do you have for the way international companies have to think about uh, the world economy and, and, and the, the markets they're investing in? Well, well, step number one is to, to really abandon the old paradigm. For the longest time, a lot of global companies operate with grouping different countries, you know, sort of matrices to, to high growth, uh, low risk, high potential, and so on and so forth. Well, I don't think that would apply anymore in the new global economic environment. Uh, what we need is really independent individual country analysis. I think the new lens to understand this, in, in this uh, countries and markets in this environment is domestic demand. Uh, interesting enough, you know, Tolstoy famously said, all happy families tend to be happy because of the same reasons, whereas unhappy families tend to have very specific reasons for being unhappy, and different specific reasons. I think it's, it's the same applies. Countries that can get the domestic demand right tend to have the same sort of configuration of policies and conditions. Uh, as I said, growth tends to be in inclusive, uh, middle class tend to expand, people tend to be optimistic, therefore the consumer market is actually creating new opportunity for new business investment. So the virtual circle of domestic investment and domestic consumption. But for the unhappy families of, of emerging markets, they all have different reasons for failure. And that's where the complexity sets in. So we need deeper country-specific insights going forward. We've just seen oil prices at the lowest level they've been for many years. Is this good news for the world economy, or is it really indicating that we've got some pretty serious demand deficiency? Well, I, I think overall it is good news because it's a massive income transfer. With the current world price of oil compared with the peak just over a year ago, it's about $3 trillion a year of tra income transfer from the oil producing countries to the oil importing countries. Especially in a lot of emerging markets, the benefits extend beyond just consumption because the balance of payment position is, is strengthened as a result, uh, which would reduce currency volatility with all the benefits that comes uh, with such stability. So actually the downside for me is over the longer term, the, the, the current extremely low price of oil uh, is going to hurt investment in the alternatives. To me, that's the downside. Effective tax policies could, to be honest, can, can remedy this, but there's not a hope in hell we, we could see that happen. By that I mean, government should say, you know, we will actually put a tax on oil consumption. If, if the world price of oil is below, say, $70 per barrel, we'll tax it up to 70 but the tax revenues earmark for alternative investment and, and, and research and so on. But that's not going to happen. So it's going to hurt the development of alternatives. And I think, to be honest, that's precisely the strategy of Saudi Arabia. Uh, their cost of production remains about $5 per barrel. Uh, so they are actually killing many birds with one stone. You are generally optimistic, I think, 
in terms of the way you view the world. But I wonder, what are the, the things that worry you, that keep you awake as we turn into 2015? What could spoil our day? Well, a number of things within, say, time horizon in the next 12 years could really rock uh, the, the, the global economy. If there's another eruption, a major eruption of the crisis in the Eurozone, which could happen, so I think the market has basically priced in more or less uh, this massive quantitative easing uh, by the European Central Bank. And should the European Central Bank disappoint the market, uh, there would be a chaotic unwinding of all sorts of positions. Yeah. And that would not be, cannot be easily contained within Europe. Now that's number one. Uh, number two is I, I do worry about Russia. Russia is a declining power and it's at the most dangerous phase of its decline. It still has enough muscle to do something to try to arrest the decline. And so they prepare to take risk. And they want to take risk before it's too late. So we are actually in a very dangerous zone, as it were. That being said, I think there's quite a number of potential upsides as well. We must mention those. Closer to home here in Southeast Asia, the ASEAN economic community, and we can factor in all sorts of delays, you know, foot dragging, which is unavoidable, will mean a very, very profound transformation of this region. And, and the delays are acceptable because the direction is in the right way. Exactly, place. yeah. But, but also, they, they're managing the integration this time, the ASEAN, managing it in a very pragmatic fashion. And there are long checklists that uh, they go through and review every year for all the member countries. So I'm quite impressed uh, with the, the approach. And uh, I really think that the potential benefit is massive for the region. Well, thank you very much indeed for spending a bit of time with us today. We'll look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you, Andrew. The pleasure is always mine. Thank you.